Hello world, it's Craig. In my last video where I introduced DigiKey's SCMP-based nibbler, we saw in the advertisement that if you weren't quite ready to drop $150 on the board itself, the curious could purchase the documentation for just $5. Now the gods of vintage computer documentation have smiled upon us because my old hometown friend Gordon, you remember Gordon, he's the benefactor of our Western Union Telefax project that we're working on. Well, in 1978, Gordon was interested in the nibbler. He was curious enough that he did ante up the $5 to buy the documentation. And for nearly 50 years, Gordon has kept this binder and protected it from the most common threats to documentation of mold and mice, moving, and marriage. And now Gordon has given the binder to me and I can share it with you. I've scanned it and I'll put a link to it down in the description when I get it posted. So it has a nice dot matrix uh, printed description of the nibbler. And then it's got the reference guide from National themselves on, on Nibble, and it's got all the, the functions and everything, tells you how to run it. Then has a assembly listing of Nibble itself. And then we get in, it's got theory of operation. And this is really nice. It has all of the signals and their description, active high and low, memory addressing, memory map, which I think is probably the same for everything that's run in this Nibble Basic. System configuration shows how to use that power supply and interface board that we talked about in the last video. I connect it to a teletype or CRT. A couple of diagrams here. Jumpers tells us how to set the jumpers on the board. Backplane, interface wiring, teletype setup. Then some sample programs. These are nice. It sh sample programs and shows you what some of the waveforms should be if you look at them. Logic diagrams. Uh, the edge connector map, so we know what all of the fingers are and what their signal names are. Schematics. Then we have a net list. Now there's quite a few mistakes in the net list. Uh, cut sheets for some of the chips themselves. Then we go on. This is a reprint from uh, Interface Age on, on Tiny Basic. This is something interesting. I'll point this out later. It says that when you're doing a test, you can short together, or actually, you connect pin 10 to ground, and you then look at the signal on pin 8, and it should put out a heartbeat. Then it's got the microprocessor applications handbooks from National. And finally, a little condensed version of the, the SCMP cut sheet that you can only use if you're nearsighted or using little bat goggles or something. So I think all of us that plan to take this project forward and build the Workalike Nibbler board owe Gordon a great deal of gratitude for squirreling this document away for nearly half a century. Now, I know there is another version of this that's more in a book form that I've seen just one photograph of it posted on one of the forums. So that would be the, the holy grail to get a hold of that. But until then, this is, this is just invaluable in terms of this project. So as far as my progress on the work alike, I have the schematic capture done and the board layout complete. I think it's ready for the fab house. I'm not sure when I'm going to send it off. As I mentioned, there were a few mistakes in this net list, but I think the schematic looked okay, but that's not to say that I didn't wind up getting some kind of a bug in my, my layout. Now, I did change from the 2316 to 2716 EEPROMs, and if you leave off a decoupler or two, there may be room around these to use ZIF sockets, at least the small ones that have the screwdriver to open and close. There's some unused fingers that I brought out to test pins so they can be jumpered to onboard signals as you like. I did add more decoupling capacitors. In my youth, I used one decoupling capacitor for every two ICs, but when we stopped paying per hole for vias and plated throughs, as long as there's room, I put in one decoupler per IC. Now I plan on taking power from the USB to serial adapter, so I think that extra capacitance will be worthwhile. But you don't have to populate them if you don't want. As I mentioned earlier, there's that built-in test where if you take uh, one pin 10 to ground, then there'll be the heartbeat on pin eight. So I added a test LED that can be used for whatever you like, and that's buffered through this unused buffer on the board. I did add a header on the top 
for a USB to TTL serial adapter and a jumper to select the power either from the USB adapter or if you bring the power in from the pins or from the fingers on the end. Now, dealing with these serial pins brings me to something that I've been thinking about for quite some time now since I first started working on this. Obviously, having Nationals basic language nibble on this board or many of the SEMP platforms was going to be one of the key selling features. After all, the purpose of using a higher level language like BASIC is to isolate the programmer from the gory details of the processor's internal operation and the nuts and bolts of its assembly language. So I fully get the idea of creating a board with an embedded higher, langu higher level language. But what I don't get so much is if the end user is going to be using a high level language, why is the SCMP the target processor for this board? By 1977, Tiny Basic had been ported to the 8080 and thereby extension to the 8085 and the Z80, as well as the 6800 and the 6502. And if the difference in processor cost between the SEMP and an 8085 or a Z80 was $10, and I could put Tiny Basic in either of those with just a couple of EEPROMs, or even sell the board without EEPROMs and then sell either a resident monitor or Tiny Basic as an add on accessory. It's curious why did DigiKey base this board on the SCMP? You know, the, the, the SCMP is kind of underwhelming for this little single board computer. And if you remember, the National Semiconductor's SCMP based board did not include BASIC. It had a resident monitor, and that was because the board was specifically targeting those learning about the SCMP and needing to understand those gory details that comes with programming the SCAMP in assembly language. Now, the reason I brought this up is because I was torn with what to connect to the transmit and receive lines to the processor. In the original Nibbler running Nibble Basic, Serial I.O. to the terminal is through the sense and flag pins. But since I want this to also be a development or a trainer board, I wanted the ability to use the serial in and the serial out pins that are more tightly, more, more closely tied to the accumulator. Now on this board with Nibble, you can use the link command to run machine code. So you can jump out of basic and run machine code, but I may want to just run kit bug or maybe a homebrew resident monitor on this. And I wanted the ability to choose between the polarity of the signals. The Nibbler already ran the serial signals through inverters before they bring them up to the outside world, so it's a nice buffer and protection. So they have both a positive and negative logic brought out to the fingers. Anyway, in the end, I brought the TTL serial port that comes in from the header on the top to a set of jumpers where you can put in jumpers or wire wrap if that's your preference. And you can connect the transmit and receive signals to any of these various offerings on the board. That's it for the schematic and the board layout. Now let's go ahead and dig in and start bringing this board up and see if we can even get it running. I'm redoing this part of the video since now I know all the answers. The first time through, I did the video in real time while I was doing the diagnostics, and this will be a lot faster to just jump to the end and tell you what I found out. And I'll just splice in some of the real time video back from when I did it. So the first thing I did was check all of the chips that I can, which is everything except for the SEMP itself. And my go-to tester is this RetroChip Tester Pro. And it would be difficult to overstate just how useful this thing is. There's a couple of things that annoy me about it, but this little piece of hardware is worth every penny. And when I was testing the RAM, I did find two bad 2102 RAM chips. And I tried cleaning the pins, but that didn't help. So I just replaced them with some that I had here. Now these are the 2102AN4L, the low power ones, and they're not even the fast ones, you know, as you would expect running off of this low processor. So when you're doing the reproduction, I think probably any 2102s you find will be good enough. All of the logic chips tested okay. And of course the Retro Chip Tester Pro can even test the oddballs like these 81LS95s and the 81LS97s. And while we're talking about these 81LS buffers, in the last video, I couldn't remember which of these was which. The 95 is an octal non-inverting buffer, and the 96 is an octal inverting buffer, and then the 97 and the 98 are dual 4-bit buffers, non-inverting and inverting. So this board has two of the 95s and two of the 97s, so two octals and two 4-bits. 
but I ohmed out the board. And then the schematics also showed this, that pins one and 19 are tied together on all of these buffers. So all of the buffers are being used just as octal buffers. Now, interestingly enough, if you look in the DigiKey catalog at chip prices, they all are running. Here's the 7400s, and at the end are the 91 LSs, and they're all running 77 cents. So I don't know why DigiKey decided to mix and match since they're all just running them as the octal buffer. It doesn't make sense to use these as four bit buffers. But there, there is one case that where the address bits and the strobes, where you would always want the strobes enabled, but for these other three, it doesn't make sense to use them as four bit buffers. So at any rate, it's really good because when we are looking at replacements, we can now choose between uh, using the 95s or the 97s, whatever is easier to find or what we have on hand. We don't have to find those four bit, those dual four bit buffers. So while all the chips tested out good, I was ready to start powering up. Now I didn't mention it in the last video, but when I got this board from Art, it had this little wire wrap adapter on the end with some, some uh, wires hanging off. It had a restart or a reset button and it had the power connected and it had the lines going off to the teletype. So either somebody was very good at guessing and reverse engineering, or they had some documentation at the time to tell them how to, you know, what to connect up on this header. So I connected the bench power supply, and then I slowly brought up the voltage while also adjusting the current limit. So if something went bad on this board, it wasn't going to overdose on current. And by the time I got to five volts on the power supply, I brought it up over a few hours. Then the current was rock stable at 450 milliamps, or 440 milliamps, which is what was promised in that advertisement. I wanted to do that basic test I told you about that was in the Nibbler documentation. It says that if you power it up with pin 10 grounded, which is the what it's using for the serial input, then there should be a heartbeat on pin eight, which is the serial output. So I connected up my Salier logic analyzer, powered it up, and immediately I saw the heartbeat on that uh, serial output pin. So I assigned a protocol to that transmitted data, 110 baud, and reset the device, and it immediately gave the sign-on, which was quite a thrill to bring this board up and have it, and have it send a sign-on signal out the serial line. So then I connected up my FTDI USB to serial adapter. And after some dinking around, I realized that even if I put 110 baud in TerraTerm, the adapter only goes down to 300 baud. Now I tried to alias the baud rate in the driver, but I soon realized that to get the divider high enough for 110 baud, it affects the top two bits that are reserved for the decimal portion of the divider. And then actually I went on and I tested a bunch of different USB to TTL adapters and none of them would correctly do 110 baud because they're all probably based on the same interface chip. So then I went back to my always reliable edge port driver. or USB to serial adapter, because I know this guy will do 110 baud correctly. The problem with this is it's swinging, it's true RS-232, so it's swinging the output plus or minus 12 volts. And this of course is only five volt input. So I thought I had some level shifter adapters, but I couldn't lay my hands on them. So there was further delay as I wired up a pair of 1488 and 1489 line driver and receiver between the true RS-232 and the five volt levels on the nibbler. So finally, with the baud rate set to 110 baud, eight bits, one stop, and I double checked with the logic analyzer. And upon reset, I immediately got the sign on greater than symbol on TerraTerm. However, my joy was short lived because other than the sign on, any characters I typed was being corrupted in the echo. So for example, here's a print hello world statement. You can see the echo was garbage. But when the basic actually printed hello world, it sent the characters correctly. Now, if we look at what's going on in the waveform, we can see that the nibbler isn't receiving a character and echoing it back to the terminal. Rather, it is blindly reflecting the status of the received data in real time. If the receive line is idle, the nibbler makes its transmit idle. As soon as it's asserted, there's about a four millisecond delay and the nibbler asserts the transmit data. 
So each bit is being reflected out the transmit as it's received. It's not being received, interpreted, and then sent back. And I suppose this is the classical definition of an echo. A canyon doesn't typically wait until you've finished yelling to echo back your whole sentence. Now, as we follow the bits of the echoed character to the end, we can see that the echo reflects every bit correctly except for the last bit, which it echoes as high when it should have been low. So now something that Retrofill mentioned in the MK14 Facebook group came to mind. Now, Retrofill says there is a bug in the original national ROMs for the Git character and Echo, the Gecko routine. And the last bit is always set. And I suspect it's as simple as up here at the beginning, they set the count to eight, but then just glancing at this, it looks as they go through, they count the start bit as that eight. And so as the time they get to bit seven, they stop reflecting it. Maybe it's more complicated. Maybe there's something wrong with the logic. I'm sure that Retrofill can chime in because I know that he has fixed this in some of his code. That'll be one of the things that I need to fix when I get the EPROMs for the workalike board done. Now, this was not a problem with teletypes that ignore the most significant bit. But since the ASCII character set has been extended up to the funny characters that have the most significant bit set to one, you know, those include the graphic characters, which is why the terminal looked like it was displaying junk. So here we are needing a workaround for the gecko bug. And it's interesting that Gordon, it must have been Gordon, made or some comments in this assembly listing. This is the only place in this that, or that there's comments in this. Now I can't just change the terminal to seven bits. So that works okay for the echo, but then when the nibbler is actually generating a character, TerraTerm gets fooled into thinking the seventh bit is another start bit, and that fouls things up. It basically will hang until I give it a, a junk character to just continue. I needed to switch to real term, which has an option for clearing bit seven. On the display page, click the box next to the seven, and it clears bit seven on all received characters. Now I can put in a little basic program, Remember, all of the instructions have to be in uppercase. So 10, print, hello world, it's Craig. Go to 10, list it. And run it. Now this is really satisfying. And this is about as much program as you want to enter without knowing that as soon as you press the reset button, the nibbler clears all of its RAM. And that seems like an unnecessary, brutal slap in the face. But I guess it's time to read and learn about nibbles so I can run it properly. Now, when I create the EEPROM for the work-like version, I'll bring the baud rate up to something faster and fix that gecko bug. And that'll solve the USB to interface to serial adapter problem and this bit seven problem. I think this video has been really good news. There was just that little annoying interface glitch, which really takes me back to the days where no two devices that were running the same protocol ever worked right out of the box. But that's it for this video. I will be back when I have more to say. Remember this channel is not monetized, so it runs entirely on likes, shares, subscribers, and viewer engagement. Thanks for watching. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.